What a great song. Do y'all know it is well with my soul? Do y'all know the story behind it? The, the, no. Uh, who's the guy that wrote it? Wealthy businessman in England moving to America. Got hung up on some last minute business and had to stay in England. Put his wife and kids on a boat coming to America. About six weeks later, he gets a telegram from America or a letter from America. All is lost. Ship sank. All is lost. All that survived were his wife and one child. And so he got on a boat and coming to America, and the captain knew his story and knew where it happened. And so when they came to the place, the estimated place where the original ship sank, the captain went and got him out of his cabin and brought him up on deck and said, Somewhere right here in this area is where that ship sank. He went back to his cabin and wrote the words, It is well with my soul. Man, isn't that, gosh, that is some true faith right there, isn't it? Anyway, great song. Horatio Spafford. I kept wanting to say Stafford, but it's Spafford. Horatio Spafford. Well, friends, I greet you in the name of our risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Good morning. How is everybody? Good. Nobody's sleeping. In our abbreviated worship service, we will jump right into the prayers and concerns. Uh, are there any other joys or concerns other than what's already on our prayer list? Yes, ma'am. Uh oh. Are you? you he, do, do you want to come up here like we made Laura Joe come up here? <laughs> Happy birthday. And, and many more. Did you say she was 34? Was that what I heard you say? <laughs> Are there any other joys or concerns or happy birthdays? Well, all right, I'll stand in a moment of silence. Then I, I have a prayer and then we'll all join together in the Lord's Prayer. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the gift of another day that we can join together and worship you. And thank you that we are invited to the wedding party that you are going to have for Jesus when your time is right. We thank you that Jesus already came to show your love and grace and to set us free from the debt that we had to sin and death. And we thank you for sending your Holy Spirit to empower your church through the ages. Help us with another breath of that same Spirit so we can continue to serve you by serving your people in this world. 
You have heard and you already know all of our joys and our concerns this morning. And we ask that your will be done in each of these situations. Search our hearts and minds this morning. And if something is there that is taking us away from you, we ask that you remove it. Set our hearts and minds on you so we can be the people that you have called us to be more like Jesus. Let us be your presence here today and hear us now as we boldly pray the prayer that Jesus taught us by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our gospel lesson this morning comes from Matthew chapter 22, verses 1 through 14. Would you stand with me for the reading of the gospel? Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. And he sent out his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding feast, and they were unwilling to come. Again, he sent out other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen, and my fattened calf, my fattened livestock are all butchered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention, and they went their way, one to his own farm, another to his business, and the rest seized his slaves and mistreated them and killed them. But the king was enraged, and he sent his armies and destroyed those murderers and set their city on fire. Then he said to his slaves, The wedding is ready, but those who were invited are not worthy. Go therefore to the main highways, and as many as you find there, invite to the wedding feast. Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered together all they found, both evil and good, and the wedding hall was filled with dinner guests. But when the king came in to look over the dinner guests, he saw a man there who was not dressed in wedding clothes. And he said to him, Friend, how did you come in here without wedding clothes? And the man was speechless. Then the king said to the servants, Bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called but few are chosen. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Pray with me and for me this morning. Heavenly Father, set me before your people today as you set the moon in the sky and let me just reflect your Son. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. So we will start this parable off the same way we start off most texts, answering the first five questions, who, what, where, when, and why, and then we'll get into a few more questions. The who, if you remember from three weeks ago, we began a series of parables because Jesus was challenged by the chief priests and the elders of the people. We are still in the same setting, so we still have the chief priests and the elders of the people. Last week, we added the Pharisees after the parable, and obviously, since Jesus was teaching, we have the disciples in here. The what, it's a parable pointing out the hypocrisy of the religious elites, or the goody-two-shoes, or the hypocrites, that I like to call them, where they are in Jerusalem. Whenever we read in the Bible, quote-unquote, the temple, there's only one temple. That's a definite article. It's like the pulpit. There's only one pulpit in this church right here. And just like in Israel, the temple, there was only one. 
and it was in Jerusalem. If you worshipped somewhere else, it was called synagogue. So that's, it's always a key of where you are in the Bible. When this is the last week of Jesus' life, why parables and why was Jesus giving this? Because he was being questioned by the chief priests and the elders. Remember, when Jesus came to Jerusalem, he went to the temple and he flipped over the tables and then left. The next morning, the chief priests and the elders come to him by what authority do you do these things and who gave you this authority? And Jesus said, I will answer your question if you will answer my question. You remember that? And I don't know about you men in here, but at my house it never works out very well to answer a question with a question. I'm just saying. Uh, if you look in your Bible, this is probably titled The, marriage, the Parable of the Marriage Feast. Do you have your Bibles? Matthew 22. Anyway, these titles in the Bible are a fairly new thing. Uh, as, are, as late as the, the 1950s, early, early 50s, late 40s, those are added to the Bible. When you sit down and write a letter to somebody, do you ever title your paragraphs? And neither did the people that wrote the Gospels, nor Paul. Paul didn't do it either. But if I had to title this, I would have called it Betrayed by Your People. And if I would have had room on that slide, I would have put Betrayed by Your Own People. See, God is being stabbed in the back by His own people, and we're going to talk about that. But Jesus came in peace to teach what God really meant all the way back from the beginning to set the record straight. We have a parable. Do y'all remember my definition of a parable? It's an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. So let's see what some of this stuff looks like in here. The king is God, and, and God is usually represented by either the king or the landowner in the parables. Those that were invited were the Jews. Now I want to be very careful when you hear me say the word Jews. Because it, I'm not referring to all the Jewish people. Because all the Jewish people didn't turn their backs on Jesus. Only the religious elites. And if I would have had room, you see I had to make my font smaller. I would have called it the religious elites on that first slide. Um, it, it tends to turn into a, a, an anti-Semitic comment. When we, when we term all the Jews together. So I'm, I try to be really careful when I say stuff like that. Uh, the wedding feast is Jesus coming back for his church. It, throughout the Bible, this is, it, it's always compared to a wedding. A wedding banquet, a wedding feast. The servants that the king sent out are the prophets. And it, we talked about the prophets last week. Do y'all remember that? There's a slide from last week. The, made, the four major prophets, and then we have the 12 minor prophets. Not that the minor prophets had a less important message. They just said it a lot quicker than the major prophets did. It's kind of like the difference in a Baptist preacher and a Methodist preacher. Do y'all know the difference in a Methodist preacher and a Baptist preacher? I can say in 10 minutes what it takes them an hour to say. So the servants are the prophets. Jesus explains again and again the history of Israel and the prophets were killed by the Jewish people toward the, toward the beginning. Now, as we get into the parable... I want you to hear this. The king was enraged and he sent his armies and he destroyed those murderers and set their cities on fires. Jesus gets apocalyptic. He kind of points out the end to these chief priests and Pharisees that are standing there before him. So this army that the king sent out, these are the angels of God they have come and destroyed cities in the past. 
Do you remember the story of Sodom and Gomorrah? And if we don't turn back to God, I believe we're going to begin to start hearing more and more of these. So, in the parable, Jesus says, Then he said to his slaves, The wedding is ready, but those who were invited are not worthy. You thought the Jewish leaders got mad at Jesus last week when, it, when they began to figure out that Jesus was talking about them in the parable? How do you think they feel with this parable? And Jesus looks at them and says, the king says, you're unworthy. Do you think maybe this is what led to Jesus being killed in the first place? Me too. So the king says to his servants, go out to the main highways and as many as you find, invite to the wedding feast. So the slaves went out in the streets and they gathered together all they could find, both evil and good, and the wedding hall was filled with dinner guests. Now we need to slow down right here. Whenever we hear of the religious elite Jewish people being set aside and others being invited in, who do you think that represents in the parable? That's us. The Gentiles. Anybody other than the Jewish bloodline from the 12 tribes. We all know the 12 tribes. God chose the Jewish people from the time of Abraham. And God made a covenant with Abraham. And if you've ever heard me talk about that covenant, usually a covenant was between two people. They split a series of animals out and they would lay them out half and half. And if I was making a covenant with somebody else, we would walk arm in arm on top of the animals and we would say out loud with our family there, if I ever break whatever this covenant is, may you and your family do to me what we have done to these animals. Then the other person walking with me arm in arm would say the same thing. If I ever break this covenant, whatever it's over, may you and your family do to me whatever we have done to these animals. That's pretty rough, isn't it? You're putting your life on the line for this particular covenant. But if you ever care to go back and read the covenant with Abraham, Abraham fell asleep. And Abraham had a vision of a smoking cauldron or a burning pot that passed over the animals. That means in that covenant, only God's life was on the line. And here we have Jesus preparing himself for crucifixion. What do you think about tying the two ends of the Bible back together at the crucifixion? I think that's part of our problem. We don't read nearly enough of it at once. Back to today's parable. Uh, I made the comment last week, and I never gave you a reference, that from the time of Abraham, actually before Abraham, from the time of Moses, God intended for the Jewish people to be a nation of priests, holy and set aside for Him. So what does a priest actually do? When I'm doing my priestly duties, what am I doing for you? I'm ministering to you the Word of God like we are here today. I go out and I do visitations. I make a lot of phone calls. We make a lot of videos around this church. But I also see a lot of people that are not you. When I walk out of here, what would it look like if I went to the bar and sat there until I was just slobbering drunk and got some girl from the bar to bring me home and she spent the night? That wouldn't look very good, would it? Because I'm standing up here and I'm telling you, hey, you really shouldn't drink too much. You really shouldn't run the streets. You really shouldn't cheat on your wife. You really shouldn't cheat on your husband. But then if I turn around and do it, how would you come look at Would you even come look at me? Or would you just be on the phone with the DS to have somebody new in here? So, 
As I stand here and preach to you, I also do a lot of things outside this church to reach into the community and to reach into our neighborhood. So that's what the Jewish people were supposed to be doing all the way from the time of Abraham. John Wesley said that the Jews got into their holy huddle. And, and I, I've always loved that terminology, their holy huddle. Just imagine if six or eight of us were up here and we were all bent down and we were just whispering to each other. And somebody else tried to come up and join our holy huddle and we all just kind of went, no, no, you're not invited. Well, that's what these religious elite people were doing. But God called them to be a nation of priests. Now, here's the reference. It's in Exodus chapter 19, verse 6. God said, you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. The problem is that by the time Jesus came around, the idea of holiness was, okay, I'm going to stay over here and you stay over there and I'm separate from you. Jesus didn't come to separate us from the world this time. Jesus came, and, and this is one of my professors from seminary, he said, Jesus did not come to profane the holy. Jesus came to make the profane holy. Do you understand what I'm saying there? And we tend to flip it around backwards and, and we think that, that holy is something special because it's set aside so we have to stay away from it. Think about Peter. Peter was a fisherman. Peter and Andrew. They would handle fish during the week and by Saturday or Shabbat, the day they go to church, Peter, would, Peter and Andrew were met at the back door and they were like, oh no, you've been handling fish all week. You're ceremonially unclean. Do you see the hypocrisy? The guy keeping Peter out was probably Peter's number one customer buying fish. But Peter can't come to worship because Peter's the one out doing the real work. There's where God had the problem with this nation of priests. So the slaves went out into the streets and they gathered up all they could, both evil and good, and the wedding hall was filled with dinner guests. Because all the fine Jewish people did not do what they were supposed to do for the king that invited them to the wedding. The king said, okay, you don't want to come? I'll just get some people in here that do want to come. Now, let's look at what actually happens at the wedding banquet. When the king came in to look over the dinner guests, he saw a man there who was not dressed in wedding clothes. And he said to him, friend, how did you come in here without wedding clothes? I gave that a slide of itself. The man was speechless. Now remember, the king represents God. How speechless do you think we're going to be if we run up into God and we are not wrapped in the righteous robe in which Jesus has provided? We're going to be pretty speechless too, aren't we? It'll be just like a Methodist church on a Sunday morning. Nice and quiet. Y'all knew that was coming, didn't you? Without Christ, we will be speechless in front of God also. I need to stop and, and say this and, and get this on the table. Without Christ's righteousness, we don't have a chance. We don't have a chance on our own because... No one's ever been able to do it. So Jesus had to come and do it for us. We're all sinners. Everybody just thought about what Paul said in Romans, didn't you? Everybody. Y'all all thought about Paul in Romans. 
3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, right? Let's go Old Testament for a minute. We have clergy that think we need to get rid of the Old Testament because God's grace is not found in the Old Testament. I think God's grace is found in the Old Testament just as much as it's found in the New Testament. But let's take a look. Let's take a look at Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6. All of us have become like one who is unclean, and all of our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment, and all of us wither like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind take us away. Here's my favorite part of that right there. All of our righteous deeds are like filthy garments. The NIV right there says filthy rags. It's not even enough to cover our nakedness with because it's just a rag. And it's probably a rag you wouldn't even wash your car with. And certainly not your Harley. None of us are good enough to go in front of God without the righteousness that Christ provided. So then the king said to the servants, Bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Throw this guy out where he will have misery. This is what happens without Jesus. Jesus puts a great exclamation point on the end of this parable. Many are called, but few are chosen. Remember now, Jesus is talking to the religious elites. Jesus is talking to my friends. If we shift this from their day to our day, Jesus is talking to me and a group of my friends. <sighs> That's kind of scary, y'all. Do y'all remember when I said Jesus didn't live with a sad look on his face? Nobody remembers anything. We're just a nice, quiet, Methodist church preacher. That's all. I've said in the past, I don't believe Jesus lived with a sad face. I don't believe that a guy could walk up to a fishing boat and look up at Peter and Andrew and go, Hey, y'all come follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. I, I don't believe, I believe Jesus was probably skipping up the beach, humming a little song, and he looked up at Peter and Andrew and said, Hey, y'all come on with me. We'll go have a good time and be fishers of men. Can you see Jesus doing that? Or do you think Jesus was Methodist? I know, I'm being rough on you all today. I do, however, believe that by this time, there is no doubt that Jesus knew He was going to the cross. And I believe that by this time, somewhere in Jesus' psyche, He was looking at these people, saying to Himself, why do you not get it? Why do you not understand what I'm trying to say to you? And I believe at some point, Jesus had to get a little aggravated with these people. He became more and more sad. The educated people couldn't get it. But the guys in the fishing boat, they understood it just like snapping their fingers. I wonder what kind of an effect that had on Jesus. Jesus walked the religious elites through their own history again, and they still didn't get it. Jesus told the religious elites their very own future, and they didn't believe it. So how does this story help me to better relate to Jesus? 
Y'all know these are the closing questions. I saw some of y'all go, whew. 